Okay, so now we're going to move to the next section. We're going to continue the journey. Uh, great, continue on, and I'll pop in now and then with some questions for you. All right. Thank you, Ron. So over the next few slides, I'm going to outline some of the uh, advanced forecasting methods and the pretty new processes that we're, we're implementing currently to really help Dollar General drive value creation. And one overall, one of the key benefits of that implementation of the integrated and collaborative forecasting system that our team has managed is that uh, ability to focus less on some of those more manual tasks like aggregating spreadsheets and manually tracking uh, template to template and having 64 different versions of, of an Excel workbook to be able to focus more on some of this uh, what, what we think to be uh, value adding analysis that really supports our strategic growth, growth goals by identifying gaps in the business model. To achieve this, we're, we're leveraging some statistical and advanced forecasting methods, as well as some novel financial modeling, uh, building dashboards to support our strategic goals, to be able to drill down and really look into the underlying drivers of the business. And the big focus at our, within our team is accurate forecasting of really anything that we can get our hands on within the within the internal uh, company economy using whatever means necessary. So what it's a little bit difficult to, to visualize, but this image here is, is an example of, of one of the processes that we have where we will have a, a, a planner provide their own forecast for, for any given item within the P&L. And we will have maybe five or six alternative forecasts that our team manages that are at a much higher level, but are built on using different assumptions. And we will meet with them routinely to say, okay, which forecast is more accurate? Uh, is what's missing in your model? How can, we, how can we improve things to provide that accuracy to really give us that better picture for how things are going to be to support that resource allocation. So if, if a planner is continually missing, we don't want to remove the ownership of that forecast from them, but we see it as our role to, to support them in improving their understanding of some of the maybe more statistical methods that we're using for other purposes to, to help them improve their overall accuracy. Yeah, I love that. And, and Gray, are you able to drill in on this data to say, hey, we, if we wanna get deeper in real time, we can? We can, yes. So this is, I think this is at a GL account level, but really with this functionality, we can set up a framework for essentially anything in the P&L. Amazing. That sounds awesome. All right. So continuing that discussion on what our, our next frontiers are for, uh, for FP&A as a group is one of the focuses is really driving the business using some driver-based forecasting methods as well as those advanced analytic tools to help us better align to forecast changes, adjustments to business strategy, and to help us quickly incorporate changes to the overall business model. So again, our fe &A team today really acts largely as that internal consultant versus a, a spreadsheet manager. While some of the spreadsheet management is unavoidable, and I think probably will be for forever. We have largely been able to move away from a lot of that uh, more manual task and be able to focus on what I would say to be some of the more interesting analysis like we've been covering here. But what we're showing in this, this image is another example of uh, a multi-dimensional tool that we've created to help us really create a full forecast for the P&L using multiple and interchangeable methods. So similar to the that trend analysis this is more long-term looking so we pull in our data points and we can choose do we want a forecast to be driven strictly by store growth uh, keep it flat as a percentage of sales maybe fixed as it was last year plus inflation and carry that on to the future or do we have a, a manual override so for future planning so uh, many of you are probably getting ready for fiscal 23 planning, but with a tool like this, we're able to, prior to having planners submit during whatever window, I think uh, most people are probably using for plan, to be able to answer some of the questions that I'm sure everybody's getting from leadership and that what is, what's the P&L going to look like next year when you don't have really anything else to base it off of. But, so as planners are submitting these changes, 
we're then bouncing against here to really try to identify that gap between the assumptions and really reconcile what what the gaps and the assumptions are and how do we best best plan and allocate resources resources for the future. Amazing. I think you you call me a spreadsheet manager there because I, I remember a very linear Excel-based model where we used to send out templates and, and even just the act of consolidating them is, is pretty painful. So really encouraging to see a, a pretty live tool as you explain it. Yeah. And this um this it the additional cool thing about this, it links to our other systems. So as actuals are changing that all flows through and that all carries forward to our future expectations. So it really helps us keep that that rounded view of, of what could potentially happen. All right. So again, one of our main goals in the implementation of that dynamic forecasting system was agility overall. So to be able to quickly and accurately reflect changes in the business environment as they become known. So the real-time nature of our process means that planners are making new changes as new information becomes available. Um, no fixed timeline. So you could say, for example, uh, think a number is going to be something based on a Federal Reserve report today, but then you read something next week that maybe changes your mind a bit. You are able to, to update that as any time that new information occurs. And while this does a little bit make it tricky in terms of tracking change to change. I think we've got a, a pretty rigid framework overall to help us keep that in line. And as these changes are coming through, we're presenting overall changes at the end of the week to leadership. And if there are gaps to our strategic target for the quarter for the year that we're seeing come up, our FE&A team is making those recommendations for how to either offset um, potential headwinds that come up or capitalize on benefits um, that result in that change in knowledge. And then we're working to, with operations and different teams throughout the company to execute upon it. All right. So this is a, a bit a bridge, but this is kind of a um, an example of how our rolling and dynamic forecasting process works. So Many of you are probably wondering how, how we're able to, to keep track of those ongoing changes week to week. And, and I think this is as succinctly as we can explain it, but let's, let's pretend this is over a, uh, let's call it an eight day period. So let's say it's Monday of a uh, certain week. Uh, sales planners, gross margin planners, and expense planners all learn new information within their respective regions. They are updating their forecasts in our model. And then for the next couple of days, our FB&A team is reviewing those changes, working with the planners to better understand them, incorporating them into our overall and company-wide earnings model, highlighting any risks or opportunities that may come from what planners are telling us, and then ultimately giving guidance on how we can meet or achieve or really however we're trying to solve it, those internal and external expectations with our leadership. So let's pretend later on the week period closes out, we're pulling actuals into our model and then almost instantaneously comparing the, the differences between those actuals and what planners told us maybe four or five days previously, working with them to understand the, the expectation gaps there and really pretty quickly setting that new baseline to determine the validity of, of the outlook from that point forward. It all really starts over as we move into week two they're learning new information, inputting it, and then all starts all over again. Amazing. Yeah. And, I, and, you know, for me, I think about, like, yes, I think back to my history, it was a very linear process and the planners would submit their information and they're essentially done, right? Whereas this, you know, involves them throughout the process. So, so how was that process to ensure they're on board and providing that real-time information that you're talking about? So it was choppy at times, but um, I think we're in a very good spot today. So it's it's always going to be difficult to convince um, someone that uh, that's not within your organization directly to to change what they do and to sell them on the 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 benefit of a, a brand new system. But I think over time we've been able to to really point out to them that this centralized system and standardized template will make your job easier. This is one place that you have to look for this information. You can compare actuals versus uh, what you thought the forecast should have been at that point in time. 
and there's always that record of truth for this is what the number is. Perfect. No, I love that. And I can see the speed of how you got move at is, is really, really powerful. All right. So this visual here gives a high level summary of really how some of our, our company-wide models are interconnected. So our FP&A team is focused on really that middle point. So the net, what we call the net income model, it, it's our company-wide earnings model. And we're working with maybe uh, about a dozen different models using a somewhat standardized service across the, across the company, and they're all interconnected. So gross margin team is making changes to, to their forecast. They can then either push it to our model or we can pull it directly from our end. And that really, that functionality really works across the board. So we're able to set up those somewhat independent models for specific teams because it's not going to be one size fits all for everyone, but it all feeds that central source of truth, which really gives us, um, it, at least from my experience, unparalleled access to that overall information and insight into what's going on in the business. All right. So again, a few of the, the key benefits to moving to a system like this is that reduction of those manual processes. So I think now largely we're able to spend a significant amount, significantly more amount of time on focusing on the more interesting tasks. So looking at what's our three year, five year, 10 year strategy. What's, what does this scenario look like to our EPS or our cash flow generation over the next two years? And really working more with leadership into um, fleshing out those scenario building and providing that that advisory on the direction of the business as opposed to those data entry and more manual tasks. Additionally, and really as a byproduct of the system itself, is that improved insight into the business overall with detail and collaboration. So we are working directly with planners and have a uh, coherent record of why a change to forecast was made and for what reason, when it was made, things like that, who made it, to really be able to allow us to, at any point in time, four or five months after the fact, look back and say, okay, this is why we did that specific action to better help us reconcile that information gap. Yeah, and no, this is really powerful in the sense that, you know, the opportunity of cost of some of the environments I've been in where you are on version 64 of that spreadsheet that you talked about, this is really powerful to say, look, we're, we're taking that time spent, which is really non-value added. And, you know, as you said before, working as a business consultant and helping the business move forward. So really, really encouraging. Yeah. And I probably make it sound easier than it actually was, <laughs> but I mean, we had a uh, a former vice president that was a, uh, a staunch champion of this framework. And thankfully, at least for the most part, we had pretty reasonable buy-in within the organization. And after a couple of years, it became part of the routine. It's what everyone expects. And um, that, that makes things, I think, a whole lot easier to, to manage. All right. So what's next for Dollar General on our journey towards a, a more dynamic framework. So we've definitely come a long way over the last five years, moving from that traditional and static forecasting model to an integrated and dynamic one. But for our next frontier, I would say the we, we want to focus more as an FP&A group on the, on the big picture. So continuing to set FP&A strategy as that of that internal business consultant versus the data manager and aggregator. And we want to build out our FP&A skill set into the more statistical analysis, a lot more AI and predictive analytics, and instill a, uh, a focus in the staff on that, that ever important um, trait in asking why. So fostering that, that intellectual curiosity within our team to really help us understand the business. So additionally, we're working towards uh, ever increasing our insight into the business and looking into the KPIs and other metrics that really drive the business to be able to provide the best recommendation and analysis and information that we can and really continuing to improve our overall resource allocation. So is just because someone tells us this is what the budget is or this is what forecast needs to be, our team having the, the insight and the skill sets to be able to kick the tires 
and say, but is this the, the right number? You're, I know that's what you're saying, but does that actually make sense within the, the framework of the business? So with the, the going on five years now that I think we've, we've had this system, a, a few of the conclusions we've drawn and the recommendations I would make is that moving to a dynamic forecast system like this uh, is definitely challenging. I mean, it, it has growing pains, but I would say it's well worth the effort uh, and you definitely reap those benefits over the long term in some of the smoothness of managing that forecast. So critical learning that we found is you definitely need that buy-in from the organization. There's going to be people that are hesitant to change from some of the processes and uh, templates that they've used for years and possibly decades. But as soon as you get that buy-in, it definitely makes things run like a well-oiled machine. And also coordination with IT, especially for the implementation of maybe a dedicated FP&A tool or uh, a function of an ERP system is essential. I, I don't think um, even as as smart as I think that we all are on our team, I don't think we could have implemented it in ourselves just because coding is not necessarily in most of our backgrounds, but having a good relationship with IT there definitely made our jobs easier. As far as selecting a forecasting tool, at least from our discussions and looking for something that would uh, fit well for Dollar General, is my, my perspective was, look for something that solves a specific and tangible issue that you're you're wanting to resolve as opposed to, to something that's one size fits all. I think lastly and most importantly, the, the selling point of leadership in implementing a system like this is the faster turnaround for forecast, the greater level of visibility into what is actually driving the business, and those additional levers that FB&A can pull to to drive business results and and meet your internal targets fantastic thank you very much gray